Good morning. It is so good to see each and every one of you here. What a blessing it is to be able to be led in such wonderful songs. We are truly blessed in this congregation to have both the Moses boys so uh, able to lead singing. And what a great job Mark did in leading us this morning. We appreciate the prayer in which was led and the opportunity that God has granted us. Don't we? To be able to come together and fellowship and worship our great God. We've been going over here on Sunday mornings a series of lessons on the life of Christ with the hope of drawing us near or more closer to our Savior through looking at His life here on earth. And last week, or excuse me, two weeks ago, I wasn't here last week in the morning, but two weeks ago, we looked at Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 8 specifically, in what is commonly called the Mount of Transfiguration. And Jesus, having taken his disciples up there, and those four disciples seeing such an amazing thing take place, or five, excuse me, seeing such an amazing thing take place, and Jesus being glorified, right, as he's shown like the sun. But Moses and Elijah there as well, and Peter and the disciples there on that mountaintop, having just before been in the valley. With some of the heartaches that went through that, they come to this mountaintop and they are glorified, they are exemplified, they are excited, they are spiritually uplifted. If there was ever a time when they were at the zenith of their spiritual walk with Jesus, to that point it was right then. So much so, Peter said, listen, he was so overwhelmed. Let us build a tabernacle or a place of worship for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. Of course, God answered him and said, You listen to my beloved son. It's whom, it's him whom I am well pleased. And as we saw that and as we talked about that, what an exciting moment that was and, and what an uplifting time in these disciples' life that would be. But as with every mountaintop when we get there, there's going to be a moment when we've got to come down from the mountain. That going up there is great and the excitement once we reach that zenith if you will is fantastic and it's wonderful but at some point because we can't stay up there we do have to come down from the mountain and this is exactly what we find take place and having that in mind, this transfiguration and all the glory and all the majesty and all the wonder that was there, with that context in mind, I want us to consider what happens when they came down from the mountain. That excitement that they had, that spiritual revival, if you will, that joy that they had, it melted away. This spiritual mountaintop that they had been on, that they had just seen Jesus glorified. They had just seen their heroes of faith that they had been taught from little children about. But unfortunately, as in all life, they had to leave that moment and come down. And as they come down, they see a scene or are witness to a scene that melts that excitement, that spiritual high, if you will, that they were going through. In Mark's account, in Mark 9 and verse 14, it says this, And when they came to the disciples, or when they came to the disciples, 
they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. Now remember, Jesus had just taken a few disciples, apostles with him. There were still nine down at the bottom of the mountain. And so as they come down this mountain, as they see the other apostles there, there's a great crowd around them. And the scribes, the Jewish leadership, is arguing with these disciples. Now in Matthew chapter 17, going back to our text, in verses 14 and 16, we get insight into what that argument is about. What the scribes and these other nine disciples are conversing and arguing over. And in Matthew 17, starting in verse 14, we read this, And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and he suffers terribly, for often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him, notice, to your disciples, and they could not heal him. Apparently, while Jesus and Peter and John and others were up there on this mountain and all this excitement was going on, where they're Spiritual heroes other than Jesus were seen from the past. Down below in the valley here at the bottom of the mountain, there was an argument because a man had brought his son to the nine other disciples who had been able to do the miraculous before and they could not remove this demon. Now, imagine... Because remember, the disciples or apostles and the scribes are arguing. Now put yourself in the scribe shoes for a moment. <clears throat> for a very long time now, you've watched this man whom you don't like, Jesus, whom you don't believe to be the Savior of the world, the Messiah, the Christ whom you've been trying to disprove as such for almost three years now. And you followed him around as has other parts of your leadership in the Sanhedrin and you tried to even trick Jesus, try to get him to stumble or uh, talk to him about what you thought were failures from his disciples' mistakes. And up to this point, you haven't been able to. Jesus has just been too clever for you as they think. And now you see his disciples without him. Not able to do a miracle they know they should be able to do. Of course they pounced on that situation. Of course, this was a feeding frenzy for them. You ever seen those sharks when sharks, especially the little ones or the smaller ones, they see some chum in the water, whatever that man, they just attack and that feeding frenzy that goes on. We're in our house with three dogs if something drops on the floor. I mean, they're attacking. They smell the blood. These scribes, this is their aha moment. See, away from your guy, away from Jesus. See, if he's not there, you really, you got nothing. And that means in reality, because he can't be God, if him being away means you're nothing. You're helpless without him. Jesus coming down and seeing what's going on, knowing the scribes, their thought process, what they're arguing about. And seeing his closest disciples there, his apostles, in this spiritually dangerous situation, he quickly rebukes the unbelieving crowd. Notice there in verses 17 and 18. 
And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. Now, again, the scribes, they've been saying and they've been pointing out in this frenzy, listen, these guys can't even do what they said they're going to do. They've got the crowd to be unbelieving. Oh, faithless and twisted generation. But in that moment, Jesus, knowing this situation, knowing what's going on, he squelches the scribes' attempts. He removes the feed, if you will, from the frenzy there and calms everyone down, reminds them again why they were there in the first place. But his disciples, no doubt feeling a little shame, ashamed, maybe worried, pull him privately to the side and ask him there in verse 19, why could we not cast it out? Now Jesus, never wanting to waste an opportunity to teach, says because of their little faith. That word faith there is translated inaccurately. It's not the word for faith. It's the word, word for unbelief. In other words, what Jesus had said to them, he said, because you had a little bit of unbelief, you could not do it. We see that same word faith right there translated in Matthew 13, 58, and he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Same word. We see it in Mark 6 and verse 6. There it is, that unbelief, and they marveled because of their unbelief. Same word, even in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 13, though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. You see the word every other time, but there is translated unbelief. The disciples, those nine disciples, were not able, Jesus said, to cast out this demon because they had a little bit of unbelief. Now, we'll get into and explain why that is significant here in a moment. But I want us to think of our next point in coming down the mountain. And what that really means, because being on that top mountain, having that spiritual experience, and seeing everything that took off or took place and then coming down, the reality is when they did that, they came down to the real world. Up on that mountaintop, that was a one-time event. It was great. It was a spiritual uh, high, as we said. It was a spiritual extreme moment for those disciples, but as they came back down the mountain, they were back in the real world like the rest of us are. And when we as disciples of Christ have those spiritual highs, there's going to be a reality with that, and that is that those highs are fleeting. I'm sure every single Christian here has had that experience, that moment, if not multiple moments in their life where they were on cloud nine, so to speak, from whatever took place in a spiritual sense. They were, or you were on that mountaintop, if you will, where everything was great, everything was wonderful. Satan wouldn't be able to come near you with a mile stick because how great things were. Maybe it was a specific worship and the topic or the songs or whatever it was, it, it got you there. Or maybe it was Bible camp. 
being around uh, all the singing and all the lessons all week around, being around those who want to do right and not in the real world for a time, the spiritual high you come off of that or you have on that, it's there. Maybe it was a specific prayer service or a devotional around a campfire. We've all, as Christians, had those moments where we realize it doesn't get better than this, where we, like the psalmist in Psalm 111, verses 1 through 3, would praise the Lord, give thanks to the Lord with our whole heart. In the company of the other right in the congregation, great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them, full of splendor and majesty is his work and his righteousness endures forever. Where we are so spiritually high, we can't help but talk to God and tell God how much we love him and praise his name. But you also know, like I do, that that spiritual high could last a day or a week or maybe a little longer, but at some point, we come back to, we come down the mountaintop, we come back to the real world. <clears throat> no matter how excited and how zealous and spiritually high Peter and James, Andrew and the rest of the disciples, and even Jesus was there up on that mountaintop, remember he was getting comforted, knowing what was about to take place by those great men of faith. They had to come down off that mountaintop because it's literally impossible to stay on that mountaintop experience our whole Christian life because as once again you and I know the real world doesn't live for Christ. Most people, those who are around in school or at our jobs or our family even sometimes, most people are not faithful. Most people revel around us in unbelief, in doubt that we're going to be around those and maybe even ourselves that are sick that deal again with different and various trials and tribulations and disappointments whether it be in those around us or ourselves but the reality is and God knows this The mountaintops is not where our faith is bore out. Because in those situations, there is nothing that is going to slow us down. There is nothing that could even challenge us. There is nothing that's going to bring us down at that moment. Our faith is truly bore out when we come down to the real world and we have to start battling again the spiritual warfare that is all around us. There's a reason why in the denominational world they strive to make their people as emotionally excited as they can, but that how they can, but that they cannot keep it sustained. It is impossible to keep that emotion in that state sustained forever. It just doesn't work. Satan's too good. The world is too bad. Reality isn't allowed for that. Living down in the valley, living off that mountaintop in our day-to-day -day lives. In the world of human experiences is hard. And it's much harder than the mountaintop. It requires a special quality and a reality check. 
because it requires us when we get to the real world and off that spiritual high to have a complete and utter dependence on Jesus. Now, with that stated, I want us to back up a moment and remember those disciples again who were arguing with the scribes. As I said before, <clears throat> Jesus had condemned them because they had a little bit of unbelief. That's why they could not do this miracle and cast out this demon in other words they did not believe enough in the power of god to actually perform the miracle but why <coughs> it wasn't because they hadn't witnessed this before no this little unbelief was not because they could not do the miracle. In fact, in Matthew chapter 10, we remember that these disciples were able to do just that in during the limited commission. The 12 Jesus sent out and instructed them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans. Remember this. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Notice verse 8. They were able to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse leopards, cast out demons. So these disciples weren't just unable to do so because they didn't have the miraculous ability. No, they had the ability. Had they not had this little unbelief, they would have been able to do it. So what happened? What happens a lot of times with us? Happened to them. When someone gets power like that, it's very difficult for humanity. And this is the reason miracles didn't last forever, or one of the reasons. For that kind of power not to seep into our own minds and we start thinking, as Simon the sorcerer, it's me who does this and wants to. Instead of saying, I'm going to remove as one of these disciples this demon, not of my own accord, not because I've done it in the past, not because I have this power given to me by God already, and I've been doing this for a long time. But because of the power of God, they would have succeeded. But no, they stopped believing a little bit in God's power and more in theirs. They started thinking, I've got this. I can do this. Don't worry, step back. You can almost see it. Everybody watch. I'll watch what I will do. And you can almost see this. It's probably went one by one by because it said the disciples couldn't do this. The next one, hey, I got this. You step back. Something wrong with you. And they couldn't. As Christians, as God's children, when we have especially these spiritual highs, these moments which are good and healthy and we want, well, I'm not saying don't seek these out, we want those moments. They are what can motivate us and keep us going, especially during difficult times as Christians. When we have these spiritual highs, we cannot forget the dangers of unbelief and how easily it can sink in with the little phrase, I've got this, instead of we have this, me and God. And by that I mean God and then me.
it's almost like, if you will, we get unplugged. When you unplug a computer or any electronic device, it simply won't work. It doesn't have the right power source. You can plug in other things to it, but if it doesn't have the right power source, you can put your finger in the socket all day long. It's not going to work. As Christians, if we start thinking we, after our spiritual high, and we come and we start dealing with the things of this world, and we simply say, I've got this, when we get into the real world, we unplug ourselves from God. And the truth of the matter is, when we do that, we will not be able to resist the devil. Remember what James says in James 4 and verse 7 on this? When he says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. But notice what he says first before that. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Because if we don't have the right source of power as Christians, which is our God in our lives, and we unplug him and think we can do it on our own, we will not be able to resist him. He will win. He will devour us. We cannot start thinking, I've got this, and unplug ourselves from our spiritual source of power, God, and resist temptation either. Because remember, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, the reason we can overcome temptation is not because of us, but because of the out God gives us. Notice, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man, God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation he will also notice it's God provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. But if we don't have God, we won't be able to resist the temptation. We won't be able to resist Satan. The spiritual highs we're going to go through in our lives are needed and necessary, and God understands that. He will take us to the mountaintop when the time is needed for us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. But he also knows that's not where we grow and mature in our full faith or trust in him. It's when we're in the real world. And we're dealing with sin and we're dealing with tragedies and we're dealing with circumstances that we can't control. When we are fighting the spiritual fight down in this old sinful world, the real world, where Satan lives and his demons run wild against us. But thanks be to God that your Lord and Savior and my Lord and Savior and the world over, Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, isn't just a spiritual mountaintop Savior. No. As he was with his disciples as they came down and their hearts melted seeing the chaos that was going on below. The same Jesus that was with them up there was with them down at the bottom. And that same Jesus he put an end to that struggle for them and lifted them up and helped them. Showed the other nine their mistake and helped them correct it. As one brother put it he, that's Jesus, loves us and with us no less when we are in the pits than when we are in the peak of spiritual excitement. I think the great apostle Paul, inspired by God, said it best this way in Romans 8, 35 through 39. Who shall separate us 
from the love of Christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written for your sake we are being killed all the day long we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered no in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us for I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The same God and Savior that was with you and is with you when you have those spiritual highs is going to be with you. <clears throat> when you feel like everything is surrounding you is crashing down. When it feels like maybe everyone around you has let you down <clears throat> or you've let yourself down. And the same Savior who was with you during the, your greatest moment but will be with you during your most difficult if we like Paul remember he's not going to leave us. He's not going to separate us. From himself. He will be there no matter what. We live most our life down from the mountaintop. In fact, the reason we are seeking heaven is because that is the eternal mountaintop, isn't it? Where sin will not affect us, and there is no sin, where we'll have no physical ailments, no physical problems, no emotional problems. Everything will be perfect. Because we'll be right next to God. But to get to that moment, that eternal mountaintop, we got to go through everyday life. We got to deal with it. But the same one who's going to be with us for an eternity in heaven is still right here with us, helping us reach that goal. He'll never leave you, He'll never forsake you. This morning, as you reflect upon your walk with God, as you look at the things in which the decisions you've made and things in which you've gone through and the life that you're now living, I pray that you are on that mountaintop. And that things are going great, but I also pray that you're ready for when the real world hits and things aren't always that what we hoped or wish. But if you find yourself in that down the mountain spot in the valley, so to speak. If you find yourself down there, know this. Not only does God love you, but we do. And if you're struggling today with anything like that, let us help you. Let us, the family of God who loves you and wants you to go to heaven as much as we want ourselves, let us be that encouragement. Let us be that strength. Let us be what God created us for, and that is to help you overcome. Don't do it on your own. You don't have to. Not only is God going to be there for you, but we can too. So if there's someone here this morning who needs that love, who needs that edification, who needs that encouragement, who needs that hug, let us know now so that we can help by coming forward as we stand and as we sing.